family. Well, here we are. Welcome, everybody, to the Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta, and we're live streaming today across LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube with my special guest, and I'll introduce him to you in just a moment. You can see him there on your screen if you're watching. Uh, it's waiting patiently. Uh, I'm really excited about this, but I want to tell you about the platform, The Quiet Warrior Show. We'll be taking this live stream, producing it into a YouTube premiere video, releasing that in the near future. Uh, we will also be creating a podcast across The Quiet Warrior Network, which is now across 11 countries. And so find the show, give it a rating to honor our guest, and stand by for that coming out in the future. So this show is all about the guests, so I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Ryan Darcy. Dr. Darcy, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, Tom. You're welcome. Well, listen, before I turn it to you, I, I, I just want to tell everybody how we met, and it was February the 29th, 2020, that I was standing on this red dot. Now, it was a carpet on a stage, and as the curtains went up and this bright spotlight came on, I did my first ever TEDx talk at uh, TEDx Bear Creek Park, the Bell Center for Performing Arts. And one of the other magical guests, everybody, that stood on that same dot was Dr. Ryan Darcy. And he had a guest with him, and it blew my mind about his topic. We became friends, and well, here we are. I invited him to the show. And so, Ryan, let's ask you a fun question first. Tell us something about yourself that you think nobody might know. Uh, well, um, I would say some people, unfortunately, know that I can't dance. Uh, <laughs> but definitely no one knows that I can't sing, because I won't do that to humanity. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. Well, we should have prepared uh, prepared you to do a song for us. Uh, that's awesome. Everybody, he can't dance, so we can't prove that because he's sitting down today, but I think we'll have to trust you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Donald Trump dances better than I do. Just, <laughs> just oh, that, that, that is a fact, and we don't need to fact check that one. All right, let's get, <laughs> we're going to get back on track, on track here. I want to tell everybody about your background and build you up a bit, not for ego, but there's a lot to this man. Uh, he's an internationally renowned neuroscientist, everyone, uh, and a neurotechnology entrepreneur, which I'm sure he'll tell us about. He is a co-founder of Health Tech Connex. It's a brain health technology company. He also holds a professorship appointments at our Simon Fraser University and the University of British Columbia here in Canada. He serves as a BC leadership chair in neuroimaging and neurotechnology, and he's led many large-scale brain and medical technology initiatives with a big, hairy, audacious goal to positively impact a billion brains. Wow. Now, Ryan, when I have people on the show, I always say that check your ego at the door. We don't want to brag. We just want to learn your story. But I have to say that when it comes to a purposeful man, everybody, what you just heard, impacting a billion brains, that is a purpose that will impact and change the world. So get us into your story. Take us back, even if you want to go back to when you were in the womb and you were born. But how did this all begin? What was your lifeline and what made you do what you do? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's a great, uh, it's a great start. I, I um, was born in a small town in BC, in British Columbia. It's kind of a cowboy town. It's a holdover town, town from the gold rush. And uh, so I've always joked that maybe uh, I kept a little cowboy in me, which turned into an innovator. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Yeah. But I, I think that I've always believe that many people who innovate, if you, and I think we all have tough lives for sure, but I definitely had um, a lot of hardship growing up. And uh, my, uh, I lost my mom at a very young age and uh, had a, a tough uh, childhood. And I think that in essence, that um, got, I remember early, I would watch, um, like all, all kids, I'd watch nature programs on TV. And one of my favorite animals for sure was the flying squirrel. And I just love that these squirrels would take off not knowing where they were going to land. And uh, to this day, that becomes kind of one of my um, uh, logos in terms of innovation. Uh, so I think I just early on learned hardship taught me to take risks and to try and uh, live with purpose and make the world a better place. And uh, that ultimately was at the root of uh, where I am today. Well, that's amazing. Well, we're going to use that as a teaching moment. First of all, everybody, I want to honor you. Ryan, for your courage to talk about the loss of your mom. How, how old were you when that happened? I was seven, and I lost her to uh, an addiction to alcohol. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a, a thread in our, our stories, as you might know. My father was a 
pretty bad alcoholic. He passed away January 2018 unexpectedly. And when I reconnected with him after a long time, he was uh, 23 years sober. And so, but the story of your childhood parallels, uh, the, the home was lost, the family was lost. <clears throat> it has a profound impact. The thing about your story, which is a teaching moment, everybody, is not all kids who go through losing their parents or this type of a childhood actually bounce back and, and become successful. Our, our brains are wired with thoughts and memories, as I've learned, that can trigger some very bad behaviors, up to and including suicide and uh, possibly taking yourself out. So I want to honor you for that. And the flying squirrel kind of made me smile. I think maybe that will be the title of the show or something. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So as far as far so th there you were and you got you got through. Let me ask you this: what what was it innately in you that that you think uh, helped you get through that one chapter? And then we'll move on to what you're doing in your career. Um, innately in me, I I don't know. I think to your point. I think that anyone who, and, and again, I think we all in our ways, you don't go into life without having tough stuff. Uh, that's just, that's part of life. Uh, but you get a choice how you're going to respond to that. And I would say that to, you know, sort of reinforce what you just said, I think that you, I wanted to make a choice not to, to be a victim or feel sorry for myself. I wanted to make a choice to find something positive and amazing in life. And, um, and also, I think when you lose somebody, really, when you're at a young age, you realize uh, that it's not a theoretical concept that life is is short, right? So, so I think you you do you get on with um, doing things uh, in 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 the best possible way. Um, and I think also some of it, truthfully, is not honorable. Uh, for sure, I didn't feel safe or secure, and uh, by achieving i could find uh, a route to what i thought was safety and security so i became a pretty big ultra achiever i guess uh, it's pretty amazing so i just to finish on this thread of the story uh, we honor that i went through the same thing but it took me a lot longer i think to figure out what to do with my past story and i didn't realize until i started studying brain science about how subconscious thoughts neural nets form and unconsciously you're triggered and uh, and I had to learn all that and unwire it to be able to take what I do and be successful or more successful. And that brings me to what you do, Ryan. You, you know, we saw the word neuroscientist across the screen, and I'm fascinated. You went into that field. So why, why did you choose that line of work? And then it's, just tell us what that's all about. Uh, well, ironically, um, I came from a family that had a lot of lawyers in it. And so I probably felt that I was supposed to become a lawyer. So I was, uh, I was pushing back and um, uh, becoming a neuroscientist. But I think it was actually I loved two things. I loved biology and I loved physics. And they were uh, early memories of, of uh, something that was very interesting to me. And what I, what I wanted to do ultimately was, I think, combine those towards uh, medical applications. And so I got really interested in the concept of um, how you can help improve uh, and impact people's brains. Um, and uh, I could talk for hours about that and tell you all about uh, all the amazing things that we can do that we don't really know. I mean, what's really important that I want to tell anyone who was tuning into this audience is um, it's remarkable when you look at the the concept of the potential in your brain and the, the way that we can optimize our brains, not just uh, within ourselves, but between people. And I think it's a source for hope, particularly in uh, when you see all these scary things that we face in the world today, you can be uh, really hopeful about the, the huge potential that our brains can uh, solve our problems and, and be, you know, make positive impacts and make changes. And so, I'd like to see more innovators, more Steve Jobs's and Elon Musk's of the world uh, addressing things like the environment. Um, and I'd like to use neuroscience to try and help people realize they can actually have control over wiring their brains so that we can uh, we can actually um, have a sense of hope and optimism and start tackling these big problems that are scary to, to me and to us all, I'm sure. Yeah, that's amazing. It's funny you bring, bring up Elon Musk. I read an article about something that he's doing and people were skeptical something about implanting something in the brain that can can deal with things such as, you know, if you have the loss of uh, your use of your legs or anyway, it sounded too far out there for the average person to grasp. I want to 
share a story with you live here. A lot of people have been following me on my platform that I slipped in a bathtub uh, the second day after doing the ride to conquer cancer. I had done 100 kilometers on my bicycle and went to take a shower and slept and fell and blacked out. I cracked my head on the tub and, and uh, came to. And it wasn't until the day after that we discovered I was concussed. I had a serious uh, brain injury, and it's almost two years now. I'm still recovering. And the side impact of that has been pretty scary for me. Life did stop for a while. Uh, everything from not able to string my words together to headaches to depression. And through that, I was forced to really take a step back and I guess you could say through the fog, uh, you know, think with more clarity. And I started studying. I was sent to a CBT course, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, by my psychiatrist, which was an amazing course. And it was it taught us the basics, things I think every child in school should learn about how your brain actually thinks, you know, thoughts, you know, emotions and, and action. But I didn't realize that the power of the brain in the 95%, which we don't use, is like a hard drive. It stores everything, and it can rule your life. I want to tell everybody that I saw Ryan's TED Talk, and it blew my mind because, you know, you can go find it. I encourage everybody to find it, to watch it, to like it on YouTube so it can get more views. But Ryan had done some incredible work with a, uh, a, a vet who came back from Afghanistan, I believe, and had a traumatic brain injury. And so, Ryan, let's get into this. The, the company you co-founded is Health Tech Connex. You said you could talk forever about all these things. Just tease us. Give us, give us some of that exciting work and the outcomes and what it's doing to, to help people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I remember when I was training as a neuroscientist and people would say, oh, I, I hear you only use 10% of your brain. And back then as a young ner- you know, uh, person who was diving into all this, I, I would ask them the question, okay, well, what, uh, what 90% would you take away? And um, I realized actually over time thinking about that concept that it, it, it's actually a myth based in a reality. So the reality is we can optimize our brains much more. And over time, we've just been able to sort of um, look at how that we can optimize the power and potential of our brains. And so what, what we do at Health Tech Connects is um, we really try to bridge the gap between all the amazing research uh, that's in labs around the world. There's just, uh, if you look at the last 20 years, the number of uh, research papers that have been published, it just, it's at the highest ever levels and it keeps going up. So we're learning a lot about how, how the brain works and, and that sort of thing. And, and that being said, while we're learning a lot, it's like, it's, it's incredible how far we have to go. It's, uh, I think any neuroscientist would tell you that there's just so much more to, to learn, but the interesting part is that when you then look at, okay, well, that's amazing. So we're learning a lot in these labs, but how much is that helping us in the real world? The answer is actually it hasn't changed that much since the 1980s, which yeah. funny enough is not a controversial statement. So what we really focused on is how do we bridge that gap and how do we actually um, unblock that? Uh, and so our, our, key to- our core technology was to ask the question, do you know how your brain is today? I mean, if I was to ask you, do you know how your heart is, you would check your blood pressure and you check your cardiovascular with your heart function through blood pressure and other measures. And yet we realized there wasn't something that did that for your brain. So we, we created it. Um, we created a scientific framework for brain vital signs and then actually a device that can measure those uh, called NeuroCatch. So what I kind of joke about is we, we created the world's first objective measuring stick, if you will, <laughs> of uh, a brain function of how your brain is today. And what's been interesting about that is that set us off on a path. Um, So that allowed us, we had a lot of people coming who were interested in using our measuring stick because they had new innovative treatments. So we could do uh, formal clinical studies and clinical trials and evaluate if they worked or not. And that allowed us to give access to some people through this research, but then we could actually once we found these amazing technologies that are across the planet, we could put them into a clinic to give more access to people. And so what we're really trying to do is continue that cycle, measure more, um, do science on new treatments, provide that in a clinic, do more measurements, and get it scaled up to more people. And uh, right now, we're probably helping thousands of people, but we want to help billions. 
Yeah, that's back to that big goal, a positively impact a billion brains. That's truly is remarkable. One of the things you said, my brain went on a journey, and I, I think three-dimensionally, you'll, you'll probably see my, my wandering in the conversation based on something you said. Um, back at your bio here, it says he's published more than 256 academic works, attracted more than 85 million in competitive research and innovation funding, and being recognized through numer numerous awards and distinctions. Uh, it's pretty amazing to me, and, and you've done three TED Talks, so obviously you have ideas worth spreading. Uh, one of the words that I will put uh, on the show to honor you is the word trailblazer. Let me ask you this, to put it into, for people like me who are dummies of your work, uh, to put it into these terms. What is, what if For the human being, what is the problem or the issue you're trying to solve, and and how does what you do solve it? And I'm thinking about that soldier you brought on stage at the TED Talk. Mm -hmm. Tell us the Coles Notes story of that so we can get people excited to go see the rest of it and then answer that question if you can. can I, I'm going to do it the other way around. So sure. it's really quite simple. We're trying to benchmark, yeah. right? So we want to measure because you can't treat what you can't measure. So we need a simple measurement system for how your brain's doing. And then we're uh, unleashing the power of neuroplasticity, which basically is your brain's inherent ability to rewire itself. Uh, so we, we have it in us all the time, but can we utilize it to improve what your brain can do? So the story uh, that uh, we told at the TEDx with, uh, when we were there together was uh, is the story of Captain Trevor Green, who is, um, uh, and many people know him as the uh, sort of the Rick Hansen of brain injury. He's Canada's most, um, I think, celebrated for good reason, a survivor of, uh, of a severe open traumatic brain injury. Uh, when he was in Afghanistan, it was 2006, and his job was to sit and work with uh, the Afghan villages and the, and the senior elders to uh, find support. We're Canada, how can we help you? And as a, a sign of, they would do shuras, and it was a sign of respect. They would lay down their uh, firearms and take off their helmets, and they were protected. And um, uh, in 2006, on March 4th, um, a young 16-year-old insurgent uh, came up behind during one of these shuras as it was starting and pulled an axe out from underneath his robe. And with all his might, uh, two hands, um, as, as Trevor says, um, uh, drove the axe into his, uh, the top of his head in his brain uh, like he was splitting a log. Wow. So, so it was definitely a story that started in a very dark period in terms of yeah. uh, right away the assumption Trevor would not survive. Um, sure. Trevor is an, an amazing, both himself and his wife Debbie and his family are, are amazing. They're purpose driven. And yeah. uh, after being uh, flown uh, to Germany and having emergency neurosurgery and then being flown back to here to Vancouver where home was uh, and having um, uh, urgent uh, clinical uh, acute care, um, nearly dying multiple times, um, he actually did emerge. At the time, the clinical team told Debbie to brace that um, to get ready, they would put him in a home. He would be vegetative and she should get on with her life with her young daughter, um, Grace, at the time. And she said, and I love this part, uh, you don't know Trevor. And Trevor woke up, um, emerged from coma and shocked everyone, had uh, real problems, of course, um, went into uh, intensive rehab where he was overcoming not only the, Im the impacts of this uh, devastating attack uh, physically to his body, but also mentally through things like uh, PTSD and, and that sort of thing. One of the parts that I really resonated with me in Trevor's story is he, during this time, at the height of this horrible, horrific, horrible time for him and Debbie and the family, he actually found his way to forgive his attacker. His attacker, of course, had, had was uh, was killed, um, but he forgave. Uh, he could bring himself to forgiveness. And so his goal became uh, to push the limits of recovery uh, and to do that through neuroplasticity. So this is where our science came in. We, we decided we would measure, we would benchmark. So we'd use advanced technologies and, and, and actually track his brain changing and show that it was changing to keep motivating not only him and all the work they were doing, but also all the people caring for them, the clinicians and that sort of thing. Yeah. So we, we got pretty good at measuring his brain rewiring and also then started to find technologies that could push the limits. And yeah. so we found some technologies that would help facilitate 
Uh, we used in particular this device called the PONS, which is a neuromodulation. It's totally painless, it stimulates your tongue, and it allows um, when you're working on recovering for extra neuroplasticity rewiring. And so that's taken Trevor to new heights. Um, we were just uh, with him and he's working on rowing. Um, I saw him do basically the equivalent of bench press. And um, our goal is, is really to see, uh, push as far as we can, even though we're now 14 years out of injury. Wow. And wow. people of course would uh, tell anyone when they land in hospital with a brain condition that um, maybe you'll recover for a year or so. And then you've just got to get used to living with, with what you've got. And our, our premise is nope, that's not true. We can measure it and then we can try and improve uh, what you've got through neuroplasticity. Uh, I love this. I, I mean, I'm so excited. And, and first of all, I'm so proud of you and your story and what you're doing. I mean, this is heroic work. That's why we call this the hero's journey, making a difference, you know, being a shaman or a guide in an area that uh, people aren't exploring. What it, What's amazing to me is the parallels when you talk about this to my own story. So I want to bring that back, that when I got concussed and they sent me to CBT, I spent nine weeks in a room with 14 people who were seriously dealing with depression and bipolar. And I, it was the first time I realized what people who are seriously mentally ill look like. And when I compared myself, I was functioning. I could get to the meetings. For some of the people there, just getting out of bed and getting to the meeting, which was a 90-minute classroom taught by a couple doctors, was a chore. And so it gave me a lot of perspective. And I started thinking about my brain and how much I took it for granted that everything I do uses that. And all of a sudden, I lost the, the function of it for a period of time. And what, I, what they taught us in there was neuroplasticity. I had heard this word before, Ryan, and understood, but not how it impli applies to things like uh, mental health. And I'm an advocate for mental mm -hmm. health. One of the things they, they, that I learned is that you, there's thinking patterns or thinking traps. And one of them I used to have was uh, instead of pausing and using my prefrontal cortex to rationalize my thoughts, I would just react. And when you react, they taught us that it never works out well. So I have a thought, uh, and then I have an emotion, and then I react to it. And when the behavior takes me down a path, but if I stop and I analyze that thought rationally, it appears different, and then I can respond. People were struggling in the class about, well, I don't get this. How can I change the way I think? And this is where they brought up neuroplasticity, and they gave us exercises to do. And I started doing these exercises, and uh, they used the term bushwhacking to illustrate it. They said it's like if you're hiking in the bush and you're going to your favorite lake, you take all your life, you're taking this trail. But one day you decide to veer right and through the bush, bushwhack, and maybe you'll get down to a beautiful beach with a, a bench and the uh, sun's out and the birds, and that's your new happy place. But the next time you go, your brain is wired to find its way still through the old trail. But if you bushwhack and you do that for a period of time, you'll automatically develop that pattern. And that's where, when I saw your TED Talk, I went, oh my God, and everybody, you've got to go watch this video. I'm, I, I know I'm over-promoting it, but for a reason. When I saw uh, that soldier come out on stage in a wheelchair, uh, being able to speak, and after you describing the brain injury, I was just blown away. And if there's anything to give hope for the work that you do, everybody, no matter what your condition is, you got to go and see uh, Doc and, and, and get to the clinic for some advice. I uh, want to ask you another question about addictions. My father uh, was an alcoholic. You and I talked offline about that a bit, and you have a story that has some parallel. Somebody told me that when someone... No, let me put it this way. I have a friend in the U.S. that I brought on my show, Ryan, and she's the daughter of a, a ex-NFL football coach. And the player was running down the sideline, and I guess he got, tack he got hit, the coach, and the coach slipped into this concussion and and uh, i think there's a term for it the one the concussion that's serious that you die from it or you you lose your brain and people commit suicide i can't remember the the the, the term for it there was a movie out with will smith called concussion and mm -hmm. this uh, what one of the side effects of his concussion was he began drinking to numb the pain of his disability and he started losing his faculties and the only way they could discover this particular type of concussion apparently is after death. You can't just, you can't see it before, and so the family wouldn't give permission to exhume the body and 
have the brain looked at because they didn't want people to understand that the, the father became an alcoholic because the brain decays. So what I'm interested in knowing is when you do your imaging, do you come across people who have alcohol addictions or does it show in the brain the imaging when somebody's being a drinker, how much damage it's caused? Um, yeah, so I think the term you're, you're referring to is CTE, chronic uh, that's, traumatic that, that's, encephalitis. That's right. And uh, the, um, that's a scary potential concept of, uh, of what's really gotten a lot of attention around concussion. Um, yeah, 20 years ago, I remember working on a chapter with one of my mentors around mild traumatic brain injury and concussion, and it was actually controversial. So it, 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 as, as not long uh, ago, in 2000, it was controversial to say that somebody could have a mild traumatic brain injury. Mm. And what, what really brought uh, the concept of concussion to the forefront of our minds and, and all the investigations has been a couple of notable um, uh, uh, professional athletes, Sidney Crosby being one uh, who mm -hmm. would not play uh, because he had a concussion. Uh, but another is just the, the work that you're mentioning where um, we started to better understand the lifelong consequences when you were in performance sports or, or, or military or otherwise, that you would um, repeated impacts that were concussive or sub-concussive could lead to a uh, uh, much more serious consequences. And these could be either um, from a neurodegenerative uh, dementia um, yeah. pre presentation, or they could be neuropsychiatric, uh, where you started to have problems with addictions and, uh, and suicides uh, started to emerge. And so I think that was the part where people started to look at um, uh, people who had deceased and look at their brains and discover um, that there was a lot of pathology and, and some of this pathology matched uh, what you might see, for example, with Alzheimer's disease. And so they started to really understand the, that um, your brain can be uh, impacted much more uh, than we thought. And that, um, that uh, if you have a lot of that over the course of a, uh, of a lifetime or a career, that can be cumulative. And uh, there's a lot of really good research going uh, worldwide now to understand and study that. I think the thing that has been really um, rewarding for me has been we've been able to uh, move the, the needle on that. So uh, wow. there's one thing to know it's a problem and not and not be able to address with solutions. Yeah. Um, what we've been able to do is create uh, uh, this neuroplasticity clinic that harnesses your neuroplasticity for good. Right. And just I want to take a minute, if it's OK with you, to go into um, sure. the way I think about neuroplasticity. I loved your metaphor around uh, bushwhacking. It's a great one. Thank you. But one of our clinicians once really drove the point home to me when they talked about the fact that people who have pain, chronic pain, can come to a place where they can uh, see a stimulus that causes that and feel that pain. They can even come to a place where they can imagine um, a circumstance that causes chronic pain and feel and experience in real world that pain. That's neuroplasticity. All neuroplasticity is is firing new neuron, neural circuits. You wire a new circuit. So yeah. in this case, you were wiring a circuit to have a pain response even though there wasn't pain there. So we would call that a maladaptive neuroplasticity. Yeah. And what that tells you is it's there, right? There's no debate that we have neuroplasticity it's not whether or not we have it or not, it's how do we harness it for positive impact. And so in our clinic, what we are able to do is take people who have uh, concussions and have then have a historical number of results that are really impacting their life. It could be anxiety, depression, um, changes in, in their just their functional uh, like daily life, the quality of life. And by harnessing neuroplasticity, even to improve something like their ability to balance and walk or their cognitive processing, all of a sudden you see this amazing watershed of improvements. So, so we get these wow. just remarkable stories of how they, their life has been returned back to them. And, and my favorite thing every week is to hear the latest um, successes of our, of our clients in terms of being able to do something they haven't been able to do in years, um, uh, their family noticing their differences. Um, Really, what we want to do now is 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 ensure that that's not just helping hundreds of people, but like I said before, billions. Uh, that's amazing. I'm getting so excited about this. Uh, you know, like you said to me 
why didn't why don't you come out to the clinic? I'm going to take you up on that. Everybody, yeah. I, I didn't I didn't want to make the show about my own concussion, but when you said the side effects, I mean, I slipped into depression. I, I'm, I'm seeing a psychiatrist. I talk openly about that. And by the way, everybody, let's get off our high horse here. A lot of people need to have somebody in their care team, like a psychiatrist or somebody who you can go and process things at various times in your life. There's no stigma and shame around saying, I, I, I need help. My brain needs to get healthy. So I'm just putting it out there. I'm proud to say I have a, a doctor in my care team that focuses on mental health. Uh, I wish I had that as a, a CEO years ago. Uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about now, just for a moment, is the idea of childhood trauma. Uh, this is something I learned through my, my own self-work, that many people have some traumatic upbringing. Uh, it leads to all sorts of problems in the workplace when you're a leader. Uh, for example, blind spots. You can't see your behavior. Others can see it. Or people do things and it triggers you, and those triggers come from past bad experiences. I'll give you an example. I used to cower or melt into an emotional puddle when anybody in business appeared to be aggressive or assertive. Not in a bad way, but they just were a strong communicator, kind of like one of those egotistical people. And what I realized, it was actually my brain saying, that guy looks like my father. My dad was uh, not a good dude. And my brain had wired that and connected it. And every time I saw it, it was dad. And I, 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 I get into this emotional anxiety. One of the things I, I did was I learned how to un, unwire that and that we have the power, as, as you teach, to change the meaning of a thought. Um, somebody once told me plants and animals can't have thoughts about their thoughts. So that's what I did, is I took a lifetime, about 10 years, to redevelop my thinking patterns to turn my dad's story into something good, a gift, and it freed me. When I was looking at mental health, I spent 10 years uh, now volunteering, Ryan, I started realizing what's behind mental health and when i interview people on my show i always find a common thread from mental health that behind it is some type of a traumatic experience i'll give you an example we both know a gentleman who did a ted talk i won't mention his name but when i saw him in the audience at the first ted rehearsal i attended i got to know him and he said uh, he said this and i'll say it out of context he said if he had just punched me in the face rather than said what he said and this fella ended up on the the downtown east side, addicted to drugs for half his life, living in an eight square block radius. When I interviewed him, it was one thing his dad said to him over and over, you're no good, you know, you're stupid. And it was wired in him, and yet his brain, no matter how successful he was, how handsome he was, his brain saw an image of himself that wasn't really true. And yet he was able to, through his own work, overcome that. Now, I went on a tangent here for a reason, that I stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. My whole platform is to speak for people like me who come from adversity and help them retrain their brains and retell their stories so that they can live a healthier life. Using what you know in neuroplasticity, is, is, there, a way, is there a breakthrough in this area where we can teach people who have been raped or perhaps who have had abuse in their childhoods or whatever, to to rewire their brains to yeah so uh, tom i felt that uh your talk was one of the most impactful ones i just enjoyed every part of it i i think it was so important and powerful for you to get up and share your experience as a leader in business and uh, show your vulnerability and i think that uh all leaders in whatever sector have to get up and and be authentically vulnerable and say that mental health in particular is something that's critical uh, and we all come with an ex uh, with a lifetime of experiences that bring us to whatever place we're at and um, certainly it's the case that with mental health uh, the the evidence is overwhelming that your early childhood experiences are absolutely formative in how your brain ends up being wired and how you end up showing up in life. Uh, there's a there's actually now uh, work that I'm just incredibly interested in called um, the Adverse Childhood Events uh, Scale or ACEs uh, that has done work to show that it, uh, the cumulative number of adverse events that you face in childhood is highly, highly, highly predictive of negative consequences and outcomes in later life. This is shorter lifespan, obesity. Um, it's linked to so many things. And, and so it very much in a very strong way validates that 
we have to pay attention to uh, our early adverse childhood experiences. I, I personally uh, feel that there's two reasons why that's a good thing um, in terms of the optimism of, of, of going forward. The first is that means we can identify and help. So yeah. when we start to pay attention to those things and we start to have a sense of it, it, it allows us the ability to identify somebody who might be at risk or vulnerable and find ways to, to uh, help them. Uh, I also believe personally, um, in my own experience, having had a fair amount of adversity and, uh, and seen that, um, that I, I definitely, if I was to look at my ACEs score, I would, I would rank high uh, on that. And um, that, I've, to your first question about what, what makes me tick, I've always felt that I had the power to adapt. So rather than take the path up the mountain that wasn't working for me, I could bushwhack. And so I could always find a way to say, okay, I'm okay to admit that this is, this is a challenge for me. So now what I can do, um, that's the big part, uh, once you, you can acknowledge it. Then the, the smaller part, to be honest, is to find a way to adapt and use it to your strengths and turn it into a power rather than to something that is uh, yes. getting you down. I, man, I'm falling in love with you again on this one. I'm just going to finish the story with this, that yeah, that's exactly the path I took. Uh, people ask me, I left home and went into the workplace and asked me, how did I survive with all this going on in my head? And I just did what you said. I, for some reason, had it in me, maybe because I'm a faith-based guy, God was holding my hand, but I turned it into a strength. But I can tell you that every day I wake up, it is hard work, and you have to continue to do the brain work and the uh, the the exercises that I learned to keep your brain focused on the right path. So it's amazing. Everybody, I'm really excited about this part of the talk because there are so many people out there that are struggling in life from past childhood situations. You listen to Dr. Darcy, there's hope um, that we can we can change that. Uh, let's let's finish up here. We have a few minutes before we uh, have to wrap up. I know we'll be talking again because there's so much to your work. I want to just uh, ask you this. There was a study done. It, it's a Canadian study, and they said they asked 90 year olds, "What uh, you know? What what are your biggest regrets at age 90?" And the top three were: I didn't take enough risk, I didn't make a big enough contribution or legacy, and I didn't reflect enough. So based on your big, hairy, audacious goal and what I said to you, do you have any regrets in life? And when you're done with your work, I know this is a big one, what do you think the world's going to look like? <laughs> so you're asking the small <laughs> questions, are you? Uh, um, uh, do I have any regrets uh, at... Uh, um, I think I think it's hard not to live without regrets. I, I certainly I'm sure I have regrets. I think that I um, I would I would say that I probably could have started my path to active growth mindset a lot sooner. Um, I think that was very helpful for me to to really understand uh, to be okay with being um, completely flawed as a human and find out and be curious about those flaws and and, and, and use them to empower me rather than uh, get my way um, and I, I probably would have preferred to start that a little earlier um, but I, I also know that in faith it, things start kind of when when they're supposed to I guess um, I definitely right. feel like I could probably stop to smell the the, the roses a lot more um, yeah. and just enjoy uh, the present um, and uh, and and I think that that's probably something I, I try to do more now um, and prioritize uh, the people that are important to me the book I, I, I'm reading right now is a subtle art of not giving a fuck and, and I think I, <laughs> I could I could probably do a bit better on that for sure um, uh, that was the first part of your question the second part was uh, what what will the world look like in in any small way with the once you're done with it with what you're doing? Uh, better than uh, when I came into it. Um, awesome. If I if I do if I do anything right, I'll I'll have been a good dad, um, and uh, positively impacted as many as many brains as I can. Uh, that's awesome. Well, there you have it, everybody. W well said. I'll go back and listen to this uh, part of the interview just to hear that affecting everybody's brain in a positive way. What a great vision. Uh, that book you mentioned, I won't repeat the title, but 
the book, uh, I've read it, and uh, yes, and, and I want to honor you and say this, that the fact that uh, leaders sometimes don't, they stand behind their egos, and people are driven, from what I've learned studying in human behavior, by getting things done, by accomplishments, and we need guys like you who work your butt off to change the world. However, we're no good to anybody if we don't, what's called self-compassion in mental health, take care of ourselves. And so I'm glad that you said what you said publicly, you know, balancing and putting some time to smell the roses. That's uh, a beautiful statement. Uh, before I do a couple celebrations as we wrap, tell us where people can get a hold of you and your body of work. Oh, for sure. Uh, they're well, uh, more than welcome to contact me uh, through uh, our Health Tech Connects. Um, so uh, probably the fastest way is to email me. It's ryan at healthtechconnects.com. Awesome. And, and Health Tech Connects has a funny, funny spelling. It's C-O-N-N-E-X. <laughs> Perfect. And of course, Googling Ryan's name, everything will come up. Uh, Surrey, British Columbia is where you're located. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, one of the fastest growing cities in North America, everybody, and just a stone throw away from where my studio is. Uh, so I want to do a couple things as we wrap up. And the first one is to acknowledge you with some leadership words. I do this, Ryan, if you've listened to any of my episodes. I write as you're speaking. This isn't scripted. But I have four words that I want to tag to you as a, as a leader. Uh, one is trailblazer. Man, you're trailblazing in an area that uh, most people don't know about. Number two is hero, and I know that can create some humility, but the hero's journey is all about having something difficult or challenge happen in your life and then step into this unknown world, go on a journey to seek and learn and come back with a gift and, and change the world. That's what you're doing. Uh, third is transformational leader. There's a difference between a transactional leader. In other words, you do that task and I'll pay you. A transformational leader gets somebody to in their heart to see a big vision gets them excited about doing their work. And I can imagine all the people working for you must be so uh, grateful to be attached to this big vision that you have. So transformational leadership, you got my heart today. And the last one is visionary. Uh, I know nobody that can tell that story you told, TEDx story, and by watching that video, it creates a vision for me that it doesn't matter what brain injury you have, there's hope. And that's that's what that's what we need. Uh, now I want to honor you with an award. I don't think I told you this, but you're getting an award today. Did you know that? <laughs> no, you didn't tell me. <laughs> All right, this tell is where me. we get to have get to have fun. Uh, you truly deserve this. So on, behind me, there's an image on my screen. Screen. Do you see it? It's uh, it's kind of this guy there. He looks a little bit like me. <laughs> yeah, good looking, good looking fella. All right, thank you. Well, these are challenge coins originated in World War I, and soldiers would carry them to make com commit to each other in a community for purpose. And I had a vision that my show, eventually, there would be about 40 a year given out, and p the people around the world would carry these coins because they came on the show, uh, they revealed their, their purpose, they revealed their weakness and were vulnerable, and they're committed to lifelong changing the planet. And the front of the coin is the image of the show. The back of the coin is actually the, the narrative, descriptive narrative of the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell, which my show is built on. It comes in a cherry box. It's handcrafted and painted. It's the, the, the images are raised. It's beautiful. And uh, I had it made in the U.S., sorry, Canada. And so we're going to induct you today into the Quiet Warrior Tribe. And by receiving that coin, you're going to commit to never stopping this, this goal you have of affecting a billion brains. So welcome to the tribe. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, you mentioned Surrey, and I think it's really important for me. Those were amazing words. I'm really honored. Uh, but the, we, we're here at the Health and Technology District, which has been referred to as the Silicon Valley for, for health technology. And there's just an amazing number of people that are here. Um, this is not me. Uh, this is me as a as a mouthpiece, a representative for some incredibly creative and smart people. And I don't want the viewers thinking that I'm I'm that guy. Um, I'm privileged to be around a lot of those people. Well, there there you did it again. That's that's true vulnerability or humility. Everybody, a leader shines a spotlight on other people. And so for today, we're shining the spotlight on you, Ryan. But this community you have there, I'm even learning about that through you. Everybody who's listening to this show in other parts of the world, you, you know, connect to learn. If you're a fellow scientist, if you want to work with some brilliant people, uh, 
get a hold of Ryan and he'll introduce you. So Ryan, on that note, we're going to wrap this up. So I'll give you the last word. <laughs> this was awesome. I loved every minute of it. I, I think what you're doing is super important. I hope I didn't put uh, any of the people listening to this uh, uh, asleep with too much propeller head stuff. <laughs> No, you're probably one of the less boring scientists I've ever talked to. I would never <laughs> put you up. I wouldn't put you up against the word accountant any day. <laughs> so everybody, find this podcast yeah. when it comes out on your favorite podcast channel. Give it a high rating so that we can honor Dr. Ryan's work and get get the word out. And find that true passion like you hear from him. Live with your purpose and live the life that you deserve and desire. Thank you. Stand by. We're going to end, end the